I'm the Senior Director of Higher Education Product Marketing at the Salesforce.com Foundation. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today, Connected Campus, Building Custom Apps on the Platform. Um, just a little safe harbor slide to let you know that Salesforce.com is a publicly traded company. And since we're talking about Salesforce products today, I um, just want to let you know you should make any purchase decisions based on what is available today. And if you want to read all of this legally, you're more than welcome to find it on our website um, and read it more thoroughly. So just a little bit of background on who Salesforce.com and Salesforce.com Foundation are. Um, the foundation is the nonprofit arm of Salesforce.com. Um, Salesforce.com has actually been named the most innovative company in the world by Forbes magazine for four consecutive years that just came out um, this week. So we're extremely proud. No other company has done that four years in a row. Um, and you know, we're not only only been innovative with respect to technology, but we've been very innovative with respect to corporate philanthropy. Um, so here at the foundation, you know, we're dedicated to helping NGOs and not-for-profit higher ed institutions to connect to their students in a whole new way by leveraging that innovative Salesforce.com technology. So the way that we accomplish our mission are three ways. Uh, we call it the one 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 model. So first and foremost, what we do is we remove the financial obstacle using that best-in-class technology by offering our solutions at deeply discounted prices to eligible nonprofit colleges and universities. Second, what we do is we reinvest the proceeds from our sales into um, universities and colleges um, and of course our NGOs into our technology, our partners and our programs, um, and then support our grant strategy to build healthy communities across the globe. And we've been heavily invested in STEM um, all around the country in STEM and education. And then finally, every Salesforce.com employee can dedicate 1% of their time to volunteering that translates into six paid volunteer days a, week, a year, so they can invest and support their communities in ways that they're passionate about. So to date, um, Salesforce Foundation has given over, you know, has over 23,000 nonprofit organizations using Salesforce. We've given away over 68 million dollars in grants, and we have given um, over 680,000 hours of service to communities around the world. But um, you know, I truly believe that our greatest impact is with our technology. So again, those 23,000 customers who are using Salesforce, um, you know, what we do is we really take a stand of what you know we term sort of helping our customers become a connected campus by putting the students at the core and better connecting with all your constituents across the entire life cycle on all devices using cloud, mobile, and social technologies. So today, what we're going to do is we're actually going to focus on not all of these solutions, but we're going to focus on the platform that makes all of those solutions possible. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about how you can build custom apps on that single platform to help you meet the unique needs of your school. So, you know, the reality is that no matter how wonderful existing apps may be, and there are a ton of great existing apps, whether they're built by Salesforce.com or on the App Exchange, the reality is that most schools find that there's time for me to develop some custom apps to address their unique business needs and or processes. And one of the biggest problems that they encounter is that it takes too long to build apps on legacy platforms. And you've got to jump through all these hoops just to get it started, and it can take forever to bring your app to market. And so all of these things take significant time, like you know, buying the hardware, installing the software, all the setup, the testing, making it mobile and social, all of those things um, can literally take months building those back-end services that you can get out of the box with Salesforce. So again, this is the platform that gives you things like being mobile ready, social collaboration tools, reporting, all of that stuff comes out of the box with the Salesforce platform, which saves you valuable time and money to bring your ideas to life that much faster. So when you build it on the platform, all of that stuff is, is built into it. Um, and our customers are seeing amazing gains in productivity and time to market. Um, one of those customers is College for America at Southern New Hampshire University, who is joining us today to share their story about how they built a number of mission-critical apps on the platform. And so they're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, how that's really helped them accelerate their time to market and bring great apps to life um, and sort of achieve some of these numbers in them. So enough from me. Um, I'm going to let our presenters tell you all about that. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our presenters. Um, so we've got three people joining us today. We've got Brian Peddle, who is the Chief Technology Officer of College for America at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, Brian has a successful track record of developing software applications and new ventures, as well as mature organizations. 
Uh, prior to joining SNHU, he was the Vice President of Development and Technology at Job Science. Uh, which builds talent acquisition solutions for social enterprises and technology, finance, um, healthcare, education, nonprofits, and energy. We've got David McQuinney, who's the principal product manager at SNHU. Um, he's got a proven track record of managing the development lifecycle of successful enterprise level applications on the force.com platform that we're going to talk about today. Um, he joined College for America um, in November 2012 and was able to quickly transfer skills and knowledge of the Force.com platform to help architects implement a student information system, a learning management system, uh, and student portal that was suitable for competency-based learning. Um, he's responsible for managing all the enhancements made to the Salesforce platform and new product lines that are developed on the platform. And last but not least is um, Doug Naylor, who is the senior Salesforce.com analyst. Um, he's got seven years' experience analyzing and mapping business processes to the Salesforce platform. Um, and after three years in professional services roles for a platform partner and three years as an analyst for medical device companies, Doug was still to join College for America back in March 2013. Um, his projects there have contributed to the design of student-facing products, the implementation of the sales and service cloud, um, for, and an interface to um, SNHU's official system of record. And so Doug believes that managing relationships is the most important part of successful virtual education and that built for us the perfect tool to do that, which makes him perfect for his role, um, which is doing over. So just before I turn it over to Brian, I want to let you know that if you have any questions, please type them into the question box on the GoToWebinar console. Um, we're going to attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, I can answer one of those right now in that this, is, this session is being recorded, and we'll send you an email with a link to the recording and the slides within a day or two. And with that, um, let's get started. I'm going to pass it over to um, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Brian Peddle. I'm the CTO of College for America. And uh, today we're going to walk you through a couple of couple of items, a little bit of uh, who we are, um, how our competency-based education works, why we chose Salesforce, how we leverage the platform on a daily basis. Uh, Dave's going to walk you through an LMS demo. And then finally, Doug will walk you through a, a coaching model and how we handle continuous improvements and rapid development on the platform. And we'll save some time at the end uh, for some Q&A. So Southern New Hampshire University is comprised of three schools, essentially. We have our traditional residential campus um, uh, in town. We have a continuing online school of education that was founded in 2007. And then we have CFA, which was founded in 2012, which focuses solely on competency-based um, curriculum, and we focus on workforce development. So College for America is designed for working adults and their employers. It's designed for those 40 million working adults who might have some college credit but no degree. Our program is built to be affordable. The cost is $2,500 a year. It's accessible. It's online, flexible, and project-based. And it's applicable. It's, it's competency-based. So what we're trying to do here is close the skills gap in the workforce. We work with partners and employers such as Delta Dental, Anthem Blue Cross, McDonald's, ConAgra. For those employers, it's all about building talent and leadership, developing promotable skills, lowering turnover, uh, support succession planning, and really driving employer engagement. And, and we've seen this already in the program. We've had people uh, get promotions, get the job they've wanted to, and it, it, it's really made a difference in these students' life. And it's been a, a really rewarding experience working here at, at College for America. So how are we different than other online universities? Almost all other online education today is still based on the credit hour and the course. We don't have any courses and we don't have any credit hours. We have 120 competencies that are tied to our AA, which is comprised of multiple projects that you can master as fast or as slow as you like. The thing we don't care very much about is time, and that's a fundamental reversal of the basic structure of, of higher education. Um, so without going too deep into the program and how our competency-based model works, I'll say this. We, we don't have tests. We don't have quizzes. It's a full mastery model with direct assessment of the student's work, and Dave will demonstrate that in a few minutes. All of our projects are organized, are organized around certain themes. Each project is then associated with a certain number of competencies. So for instance, you might have competencies that involve critical thinking, uh, communication skills, quantitative reasoning. You might demonstrate those by doing a business memo with a spreadsheet, perhaps, that attacks a, a specific business problem. All of those submissions are then evaluated by reviewers who provide project feedback. So these are trained educators with advanced degrees and they're subject matter experts. 
So instead of traditional grade points, every project is evaluated as mastered or not yet. Students are then allowed to revise and resubmit projects until they demonstrate mastery. So there's really no failing here. You keep trying until you get it. So why did we pick Salesforce? Um, you know, we, we started to design these systems in September of 2012 for a January 1st launch. So we basically had four months to get something out the door. And there was no way in the amount of time we could successfully adapt the existing systems in place to do what we could Just potentially do. CRM, do. colleague, all the other back-end systems. It just wasn't possible. And to add to that, we weren't even 100% sure how some of our processes would play out. Um, it, you know, it was often said around here we were building a plane while we were flying it. And we were. We were building a new competency-based program decoupled from the credit hour and we're essentially designing the curriculum, the processes, the rules and systems in parallel. So there was rapid change occurring. Salesforce allowed us to iterate rapidly and get immediate feedback from all the stakeholders. We we're essentially doing agile at an extreme level. Uh, when any project starts out, we always try to approach it as a minimal viable product. Our goal is not only to get something in our users' hands fast, but that also that improves how they work. And Doug will show you an example of this later when he demonstrates that process in action with our coaches. Just a, a, an incredibly brief timeline of what we've done uh, at the launch here. I mean, from September of 2012 um, to January 13, there was really just three of us here. So with the power of the platform and AppExchange partners, we were able to move very fast and get a lot done. I mean, we did uh, initial data model builds out. We integrated with DocuSign, New Voice Media, Form Assembly. We leveraged Salesforce as our identity provider to do single sign-on to Canvas and Google Apps and built our initial portal. When we did launch in January, we did go out of the door with Instructure Canvas. We quickly found it wasn't going to meet our needs for our competency-based projects. So that's when we really started to bring this in-house, and we did that uh, from April to June. We had the back end in place, and then we just wrapped our front end around it, which Dave is going to show you. So right now, I am going to uh, I'm going to hand this. I'm sorry, leveraging the platform. Just one more thing, as you can see here, um, before I give it over to Dave. Um, because I'm really excited about the next slide, sorry. Uh, <laughs> as you can see here, we're, we're leveraging the App Exchange partners. We've created integrations with Amazon, Colleague. We have custom apps, a whole range of products from Salesforce. Uh, the one thing we found over the past two years is once our internal users got a taste of Salesforce, they wanted more of it. So little by little, we've rolled out more and more. And when you see those custom applications, those three on the left, the portals, those are for our students. And our, and our reviewers, we have a curriculum development uh, tool that we built, and we even built our own Agile manager. So everything we do is in Salesforce. Um, everybody has a complete view into all the work that my team does and across the organization. And it's really been beneficial to be connected like that. From uh, we, you know, Someone posts a chatter message, someone quickly jumps on to it. You don't have to wait for an answer. Everyone's contributing. And little by little, the adoption of chatter is really picked up to the point of uh, we can't really live without it anymore. We've got We've got coaches spread out around the country. People work from home. So it's, it's been a great tool for us to use. So right now, uh, I'm going to bring up Dave, who's going to do an LMS demo. But before we do that, I know many of you are going to Dreamforce. So I just want to give you a Dreamforce tip. Uh, and Dave is on the right. And he gave an incredible selfie. This may be the best selfie around. So if your friends and coworkers say, hey, let's take our selfies in our hotel rooms and chatter and then send them over, don't believe them. Because you'll end up in a frame and given as a Yankee swap gift. And now you can see Dave on the left goes on tour wherever our employees go. And here he is with Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> with Lincoln on tour. Dave was nice enough, though, to sign the picture. And now any new employee who comes to work at CFA gets to have that on their, their desk for a week. So if you want to sign copy, feel free to uh, reach out to us and we'll, we'll make that happen. I'm, I'm not sure, Brian, if you're encouraging people to go to Dreamforce or scaring them from it. No, this is good. You should want to take pictures. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brian, for that um, excellent introduction. So uh, as Brian mentioned, in um, October 2013, we went live with our, with our portal for all of our students. And since that time, we have gone through what we call our MVP model, where every four to six weeks we are enhancing and iterating around the existing features that we provide and actually implementing new features and then iterating on those features as we move forward. As Brian mentioned, we do this because it's great to get information to our students so we can actually gather great feedback from them and then make sure that we're expanding those features based on what our, our students are asking for or what they're seeing. 
So um, again, we are using Salesforce as the identity provider. So one of the features that allows us to do is single sign-on with our Gmail, which is all of our students have College for America Gmail accounts, and the single sign-on allows us to hook right into the Gmail seamlessly so the students don't have to remember multiple passwords. So as students log in, this is what we call our dashboard. So the dashboard really represents everything that the student is working on currently. As you see across the top here, we have what's called the progress bar. This progress bar allows our students to kind of visualize where they are in the program. You'll see three different colors on the screen. This entire bar represents 120 competencies, as Brian mentioned, is what our AA program is built off of. The dark green represents all the competencies that the student has mastered. So as a student hovers over, they can see that they're 8.3% of the way through the program, which equals about 10 competencies. The light green is what they have in process, and those are all the projects that, have they, that they've scheduled themselves. As we had mentioned, we don't have faculty, we don't have advisors. What we do is we provide the student the goals that they're going to be working on in any given term, and then it's up to the student to actually schedule those projects and start to work on them self-paced or with the help of a coach that helps guide them through the system, which we'll talk about um, as we move forward. So as you can see here, this test student has 20, would be 24.2% of the way through the program and 29 competencies if they master all the project that's projects that they've scheduled for themselves. So the activity feed is um, kind of like their lifeline. This is what they're currently working on. You'll see that these are um, projects that they have scheduled that they're in progress. So the student can quickly see and visualize where the status or what the status is of every single project that they have open. Our coaches kind of coach our students to you know, have no more than three or four projects open at one time because they feel that's the sweet spot of them moving through the system. If you have too much open, they kind of overwhelm themselves. On the home page of the dashboard, the student also has access to communicating directly with their coach. So if they click on their face, this takes us to um, what we call the student coach chat panel. And what this is leveraging is actually private messaging on, on Salesforce, which comes right out of the box. However, through the power of the platform and the amount of times that Salesforce um, pushes releases out to us three times a year, and I believe the spring release, they allowed us to use community seats, or allowed everyone to let community seats use the private chat feature. And prior to this feature, we actually had to create a new object that hung off of our student contact object. And then we actually used the chatter feed on that particular object to communicate. It, was, it would suffice at the beginning, but what that actually did was that posted messages that the student was going back and forth with the coach up into the actual all-company chatter feed. And it kind of made a mess for these coaches to kind of filter out and find the exact information that the student is sending. So with the power of these updates, we were able to actually quickly iterate and change the way that this page evolved or functioned. And we're now using private messaging between the coach and the student. So the coach can now, as a full site, full license of Salesforce, can actually just hit, click into their chatter feed, go into their private messages, and see all the communication between them and any of their students that are trying to reach out to them. And another great power of the platform out of the box is since Chatter has its own set of permissions around when a user would like to get an email, one of those features is these, now the coach is going to get emails directly from the system, which allows them to actually reply to those emails, which will actually set itself right back into the Chatter feed and go back to the student, and then vice versa, the student gets the email letting them know. So the student doesn't necessarily have to live in the platform to see this communication going back and forth. It all flows out of the system seamlessly. We don't have to code that. It comes right with Salesforce, and it was very easy to implement. And the last main feature that we see on the dashboard is the students to do. This is more of, again, a honeydew list. It allows the student to create some personal to-dos that they'd like to do, like call my coach. When they're done, when they finish their coach, they can actually check that off, and the next time they hit this page, it's gone. It allows the student to fill this up with resources that they'd like to work on for any given project, as you can see here. On top of Mount Rubric, which I'll show you in a moment, is a project within our program. And these are actual links to resources that will open up that we have tied to our program. And, and one other element in the orientation is uh, in the checklist is the orientation checklist. So when new students are onboarded, they have a checklist of things they need to do as new students, whether it's be call a coach, fill out a form, that would show up on the right-hand side as well. Thank you, Brian.
So as Brian also mentioned that we have 120 competencies. Those competencies are wrapped around 20 goals. And again, what we found out is when we were in the Canvas model, we had opened up all 20 goals to all of our students right from the beginning of the actual program. And we had the student working with their coach kind of choose which goals they should actually start on. What we quickly found is the majority of our students found that overwhelming and didn't quite know where to start. So they kind of really wanted a prescriptive model where we're going to kind of help them and guide them and where we feel they should start. So again, we quickly iterated around the data model. We were able to actually hide certain goals and unlock very specific goals at the very beginning. We actually also scheduled the first project based on what we call an, a student questionnaire. And um, this actually will help speed the process along. They, when they log into the system, they will actually see their first project that we ask them to work on. So this is what we call the goals page. As you see, it's, it's got five goals listed. This is for my demo here, four goals listed. And this is just kind of a listing of short description of the goal and what program they're in. And if they want more details about the goal, they actually click in. And again, all this information, the curriculum details, all live within Salesforce. There are, I don't know, six to eight objects that actually make up the full curriculum. And we built out, we built our own curriculum management um, software all within the platform itself. So if you all imagine Salesforce is a lot of clicks. And what we were able to do with some minor coding was actually reduce the amount of clicks, still write to the same amount of records, and actually present the data back to our CAD team, which is our curriculum assessment development team, as they're developing either new content or new versions of existing content. So again, all that built on the platform, and those, those using that particular piece do not see Salesforce as we all see Salesforce as admins. They just see it as a nice, very fluid interface and drag and drop and data goes where it belongs and then we actually present it to the student. So on the actual project on the goals details page, I apologize, the student actually has the ability to see some descriptions of the goal, the competencies that the student is going to gain along the way as they master projects. They also get to see the different types of paths. So in our associate's degree program, we have what we call the blue path, which is a bunch of or anywhere from two to four medium-sized projects, but they run independent from each other. And then we have what's called a purple path, which I consist or I equate to like an advanced class, where it's one large project, more deliverables in that one large project, but that's the only project that you're going to have to master to actually gain all the competencies for this goal. So I'm going to jump into what we call a blue project. So on the project details page, we're actually going to start to list again, this is a blue project, so it's going to show which competencies the student is going to gain upon mastery some overview and directions about the project, what they're going to work on, what is expected of them, and the deliverables on the output. So in this particular project, we're expecting to see five deliverables that the student's going to work on, and during the submit process, they're going to actually upload all these documents. Um, we're using uh, re curated resources that we found out on the, um, that we're using, they're on the web, and um, this actually helps us reduce cost internally. So we have a whole CAD team that curates these, keeps these up, and if they go, if for some reason they are no longer available, we actually find new resources and replace them. And the rubric is also listed on the project details page, which shows the student what they're going to be evaluated on once their deliverables are submitted to our reviewers. The one thing I want to um, talk about is, is that how we're using communities and chatter as well is every time we have a team, so you'll see that we have a team of four folks on this particular project, so we have a few team projects built throughout our program. What we're doing is we're leveraging Chatter to actually build a feed so the students working on this project can collaborate. And I'm just going to click on our team feed in this particular project. And this is actually using Chatter as you know it outside of some small customization that we've made to reduce some of the I don't want to call it clutter, but some of the features that Salesforce allows out of the box, we did not want to allow to our students immediately. So in this case here, you'll see that we're in a, we're on a, um, we have a team project, which is a record in the system. All team members part of that project are other records that sit below, but we're actually using the parent objects chatter feed on the record itself. Uh, our initial goal, our initial go around was going to be creating groups but Salesforce does have a limit on the amount of groups that you can actually create in an org. So instead of running into that limit at some point, 
what we've done is we've actually taken a record feed that has no group relationship at all. All of our students who are community seats follow that record, and those are the only ones that can actually access the record and post threads and comments and actually move through and use this feature. I think this was a really clever solution on our part. So I mean, I think you've got you've got sometimes you have data you have uh, governor limited Salesforce that you have to get around. We didn't want to run up against that ten thousand group limit. As the student body grows, you, you don't want to have to sit there and maintain all these groups consistently. So by leveraging the actual object and the record where these students were tied to, we get the same we get the same benefit of groups basically without the group, and we really keep that team contained to the project they're working on and then can quickly review what's going on. Are they active in the project? So it keeps things really nice and tight. So I think this is, I think Dave did an incredible job at coming up with the solution to uh, leverage communities and, and chatter inside of a record. And we'll talk more about how we're also leveraging communities outside of just that one particular uh, scenario that we have here. So I'm just going to go back to the project quickly. So our students, when they're rolling through the program, they have the ability to go in and schedule their projects. So we pick a date, and what this does is this actually opens up the record for the student to start working. And again, we have a create team feature. And this is another team project where the student goes in and then starts to search for their team. And the way that we actually are going to be leveraging Chatter as well is we're going to have a group called Find a Teammate. And within that group, they're actually going to try to find people working on the same projects. And then, and I'm not going to be able to show you because there they're aren't going to be any students, but if there were students that also had this team uh, project scheduled, all I have to do is type ahead and it would find the person that is working on the same project that I, as I am that is not already part of a team. So what this does is that actually generates several communications back and forth to all the team members. Every other team member must accept to be part of the team and once that occurs, then the team can start working on this project together and that team feed would appear and they would allow to go through the system and work on on um, their deliverables. So students also have to submit their work. So since we're up in the cloud, there's no faculty. They're not handing in papers. They're not faxing in papers. They're going to use a, uh, the platform itself. And um, this is where they're going to submit all their electronic de deliverables. So we also require our students to fill out what's called a project reflection survey. Again, all this data lives in, in the system itself. So our student experience team can, can actually review what their student experience team, including the coaches, can actually review what their students are inputting during these projects so they can kind of get an idea of where their head is at and help them move along the system. So this is a um, our submit work window. And our students, give me one second, I apologize, would come in and they can drag and drop. They can add your files like a standard lookup to um, into your, your file structure on your computer and actually add to the system. As you can see, we're expecting, in this case here, we're expecting three deliverables. So in, I cannot submit my project until at least three deliverables are in there. And then they actually submit their work. What this is going to do is this is going to go, and again, this is a team project, so it's actually waiting for other team members to submit their work. I'm actually going to jump to a non-team project quickly so we can show you what it looks like from the reviewer's end. Well, Dave's doing that just so to, to make clear on the team project. So in the team projects, there are single deliverables, there are team deliverables. We wait till the whole package of deliverables is are, and uh, upload it before it gets sent to the reviewer uh, to be viewed. So here's Dave in the reviewer portal now. So now, again, we're using communities, and we have built a separate portal for our reviewer users who are also using community seats. And what we've done here is, is a quick dashboard that gives a listing of all student projects that are sitting in their queue waiting to be, waiting to be reviewed. Now since uh, what we've done is we have a 48-hour turnaround time, so our reviewers are supposed to actually review this content and get their response or their evaluation back to the student within 48 hours. So on this dashboard, anything in yellow kind of says that you're... In this case here, I'm just going to jump into Dina Demo's project that we've just uploaded. And just from one simple view, the reviewer has access to everything they need to be able to evaluate the student's work. They have access to the project details that we saw as a student. They have access to reviewer guidance, which is managed by our feedback center team. They can we convert documents on the fly using Crocodoc. We actually track how many times this document is opened, who opened it, and whether it's a, a preview or download or other. 
They can download the document. The reviewer has quick access to the rubric. So this is the same rubric that the student sees. In this case here, I'm going to take a look at this one particular project. And this project was a not yet initially. So from the reviewer side, or from the student side, they were going to get a not yet, which Doug will discuss in, in a little bit as well. And anytime a reviewer is submitting information back to the student, it's a requirement that they actually enter feedback, constructive feedback, not just, hey, sorry, you didn't make it, but hey, you did well. However, I think you need to work on this particular part. Take a look at this resource, and it will help you. And as you can see through this thread, that the um, reviewer actually told them that they didn't quite make it, and they should look at a particular piece on a, on a, on a document. The, re the student actually can reply back, can explain a little bit further, I don't quite understand, and then the actual reviewer can actually comment back on top of that. So there's some dialogue back and forth before the project becomes mastered. So as I'm going back to the reviewer, so I, the reviewer, has, I'm going to come in and change my slider to the item that was marked not mastered. I'm going to master that and put in some test feedback. So at this point, the reviewer is going to record and send and bring the project back into the student's hand. So it leaves the portal. It's off the reviewer's screen. So it's really just a run list of what the reviewer has to do. So now every time a project status changes, the student is going to get an email letting them know whether it's a not yet or a mastered. And if it's a mastered, they're also going to get a link to a survey where they can actually grade the curriculum itself, which helps our CAD team whether they need to work further on a project or everything's status quo. So as I refresh this page, this was a not yet and has gone to master pretty quickly. So from next piece I want to cover really is our project portfolio. So the project portfolio really is just a, a full view of where the student is in the system. So they have access to all their projects listed by completed all the deliverables that they've actually uploaded during it, all their feedback that they put in for their reflection survey, they have quick access to seeing all that. They can download and preview all the documents that they've uploaded. And at some point we are looking at um, integrating with LinkedIn to kind of tie in projects that the student is proud of to kind of link into their profile that's online. So that's going to be coming in, in the future at some point. Um, Last piece, or well, second to last piece I want to cover as I speed through this, we're actually now using, we're also using communities itself as you, as you know it. So we have a learning community where all students that come into the system will automatically be part of the learning community group. And this is the group that they'll go to when they'll just start posting and, and commenting on feedback and liking just like you do in Chatter internally. But we're controlling which groups the student is actually going to be part of. So this is where we've gone in and customized the actual out-of-the-box solution, which we tried to do at the beginning, but we found that there are just so many features that are wonderful, but we just quite weren't ready for everything to be exposed to the student, and you couldn't get down to that granular level to shutting pieces off. So we've gone in here, and we're just exposing uh, access to their profile, private messaging, if they want to chat back and forth with other students or their coach. This is just a general feed, the same feed that they they drop to here. We use a, a, a custom setting to drop them to a default a group when they actually access the feed and all the groups that the student may be part of. So we have a little news and alerts here where students can come in and, and when we launch this piece, this one is not out yet, but when we launch this out to our students, students will only be able to read the actual campus news and comment and we're going to actually have settings to whether they can even comment so they can like and look at any upcoming features, whether we are pushing a new program or there's sign up for our virtual football team, stuff of that nature. Um, we're trying to partner with Madden Football to get a, a CFA Madden football team out there since we're in the cloud. Just one thing on this, I, we, as Dave mentioned, as we talk about minimal viable product, Dave did mention we went out of the gate with just standard uh, chatter communities as is. It didn't. Uh, we did a proof of concept. We found out what we liked, what we didn't like. Before we even spent, a, you know, that was all configuration based. So before we spent any time developing something custom with custom code, we knew exactly what we needed. And what Dave is showing you here, and what he showed you earlier with the team project, took our team about three days to put together from from going from that that test 
but out of the box functionality to what he showed you earlier. So it's really rapid development once it, once you know exactly what you need to to get done. I know Dave's got a couple other things to show here. If you can just dump in real quick, I mean we integrate case management in here. We've integrated knowledge management in here, knowledge bases here. So everything's built into the system uh, on the Salesforce side. And again, everything you see here is built on the Salesforce platform. This isn't a separate LMS. This is 100% Salesforce using community licenses. And uh, all our students get licenses. What happens is when they register, we immediately uh, provision a user for them on Salesforce and at the same time provision a user on Google. So it all happens pretty quick. Um, we're running a little tight on time, and I want to get to Doug, so if Dave, you can pop up that um, deck again. We'll slide over um, and get, get Doug talking. Um, go right there. So real quick, I'm going to have Doug come in here. And uh, as, again, this is another great example demonstrating minimal viable product is, is what Doug's going to show you next. Um, over the past year, our coaches have been learning just as we've been learning. And as I mentioned, we had and have had a lot of parallel development going on. You know, one day I was sitting in one of the coaches' meetings, and it was mentioned that it was taking them about 20 to 30 minutes to prep for a student call. They had to sift through a seemingly endless page of data points. To me, this was just unacceptable and not scalable in the least. So after a few meetings, we, we, we knew we wanted to build something easy to use, and uh, we just started calling it just-in-time dashboard. We wanted to surface the right data at the right time in the right way. We were also where the coaches weren't exactly sure what those data points would be. So this is really where Salesforce comes to the rescue in a big way. Doug's going to show you how he was able to use standard Salesforce functionality and iterate almost deal daily without writing a single line of code. And this gave, this gave the coaches immediate relief while we were learning what was actually important to them. So instead of spending months writing specs and hoping we got it right, we iterated rapidly using the power of the platform, and when it came time, to write custom code, we had a really deep understanding of how the coaches were working. So, if Doug, you want to take over here and uh, talk about what you guys have been working on. Yes, thanks, Brian. So, a quick word about uh, CFA coaches. Uh, one of the, you know, one, I think one of the truths about education all over the all over the place and all over the world is that uh, relationships matter to students. And from uh, a perspective of a virtual experience, uh, the CFA coach provides that relationship to the student. And so if you think about a working adult that doesn't have any credentials, uh, they're going to be a little bit intimidated with school. They're going to be a little nervous at the beginning. But what we're hoping is that by the end, while they're getting close to their degree, they're starting to get some confidence and starting to think about, well, what do I want to do next? Where's my career going? Where's my um, credentials going? Do I want to do more school? And so the nature of the relationship uh, between the student and their learning changes over um, the student acquiring their degree. And so the coach is there to help the student at the beginning uh, get into the routine and start becoming a self-directed learner. And then towards the end of the program, the coach is really there uh, to start talking about what's next. And so in the meantime, there's all kinds of conversations and, and chats and chatter messages and phone calls and emails uh, that go back and forth that the coach needs to handle and have a handle on. And so what I want to do is take about two minutes to log in as uh, Coach Bob and go all the way back to uh, July of 2013 and give you a sense of what Bob saw. And then I'll switch in and I'll spend about six minutes logged in as Coach Glenn. Um, and I'll go down a list of about eight or ten items that are all configuration that are all baked right into the platform. Uh, so while we'll be sharing some stuff on the contact object, you can still do anything that I've done on any custom objects for a custom application as well. And then with the last two minutes, um, I have uh, the just-in-time visual course page uh, up. It's still totally in development, uh, but I'll give you a sense of where we want to go. And so this is Coach Bob. Uh, when we first started, we had a single list view for the coaches uh, that just showed the coach uh, any student that they owned. So we had three or four columns, and at the time, the coaches were being assigned to students by the, uh, the company that we were partnered with. And so they'd be interested in seeing their McDonald's students or their Anthem students. And then they were also interested in uh, students by cohort, so the CFA start date, uh, things like that were pretty important to the coach. So you can see it's pretty basic, it's pretty straightforward, um, you know, almost no time to provide for them. 
But then what happened is they'd click into the student record, and you could actually see that as we developed on the fly, the page layout sections kind of reflect the fact that we were just sort of adding the things that we started with. So when we talked about um, you know, the preliminary academic goal planner that got added to the section, the registration details were next, program details. Um, and then towards the bottom, we had some students withdraw during the pilot. And so we added the withdraw details. And then further along, uh, further along in the program, we came up with an ambassador program. And so we wanted some fields to show um, to track ambassadors. And so those things kind of got added at the end, almost without thought. And for the coaches, uh, they just kind of magically appeared. We, someone else might have requested the field. We'd add the field. We'd add the section. Um, and it was there. Uh, so getting back up to the top. The same thing happened with list views, where uh, Dave was talking about student projects and surveys after the project and kudo records and cases. And we came up with transcripts so that we could pass data into the um, information system. So all of this was kind of bewildering for the coach. They weren't sure exactly what was there and never mind really be sure of what they needed uh, to help, help the student. And so let me get uh, Coach Gwen in front of you. And I'll just go through each one of these uh, items that I'll show. Might have taken um, you know, an afternoon to configure. I'll try to go through them relatively quickly. Um, there's probably about 10 different features that I'll try to touch on uh, and just kind of share a quick little story about um, how we would meet with the coach, talk about what they thought that they wanted to see, iterate that afternoon, get something minimally viable up for them maybe even the next morning at the beginning, um, and then get some feedback even that afternoon. So the first one is um, in contrast to the list view that we started the coaches with last August, we're able to give all the coaches a dynamic dashboard. And on the dashboard, we uh, replaced, uh, we were able to give them a couple filters up at the top. So the same idea from the list view, we were giving uh, the coaches uh, a, a way to sort through and find different students by account name, by start date, by cohort. But then we also started giving them some other data right at the top that would help them do things like uh, help students stay on track. And so if they were on pace to achieve less than 24 competencies during a given six-month period. Uh, who is that student, and can we move uh, the coach into a place where they can help? So this is the page layout. Uh, same page, same student that we were just looking at. And what we did is we said, well, on the dashboard, we're giving you some of these charts to show a flag. But the student might exist on several of those reports, because maybe they're flagged for several different things. And so the first thing we did is we configured some custom formula fields. And we used a, a app exchange package that's free uh, to get a green flag. And so we added some color right away. Then the second thing we did in the winter of 2013, uh, Embedded Analytics came out with report charts. So this was a really huge win for these guys. Right at the beginning, we were talking about trying to get some visuals onto the coach detail page. Um, we did have this goal progress bar that you're seeing down here as a visual force component, but again, it was code. They kind of needed to know what they wanted, and changing it was kind of hard. And so the report charts gave us the ability to configure a chart uh, right on the fly. And then as the coaches said, geez, you know what, I want a group this way, I want a bar chart here, maybe a circle chart would be easier to read. Uh, all of those kind of things were able to just use the native reporting engine and um, using the chart on a report. Uh, to change what the coaches saw. The other thing we did is uh, a real quick win was the um, related lists. And so earlier I showed you a whole bunch of lists that had a whole bunch of information, uh, but we didn't really pay any attention to adjusting the columns or the order that coaches saw things in. And so one of the real early stories, Dave was, Dave was just sharing with you, hey, these students submit their projects. The evaluator gives you some feedback. Um, so for a student that gets a not yet and they're really struggling, they're going to ask their coach, hey, I can't figure out how to master this project. I've used the resources. I've gotten some feedback from the feedback center. Uh, what can you do to help me out? And the coaches would say, geez, I need to see a list of all my students at a not yet status. And I really want to look at their work and the feedback that they're getting. And so what I'll do is I'll just right click. Well, hover over the not yet status. So we, we just put the status not yet at the top of the related list so they could find it really easily. 
And then the second thing we did is we configured a link on the student project. So this is a custom object. Uh, so what we can do now is we can click right on the link from the student project record. And this opens up a report to, uh, well, there's no, there's no link here. But anyways, it's one click. Uh, and the coach is able to get direct access to the student's work. And so when I was Coach Bob, I wasn't sure of the student project. I couldn't even find the Not Yet Student Project. When I clicked onto the student project, I wasn't sure where I had to go to drill down to get to the work. And so with three clicks, the coaches were able to do that. So the last thing is a, um, we did a uh, publisher action. And so if you look at all the fields that we have and all the things that we present, where to go to find things that you're expected to update after a phone call was a little difficult. And so we replaced the global publisher action with uh, two custom actions, and one of which is, is just a bunch of fields that the coaches might want to update. And really a big win for those guys was just the preferred phone and the preferred email field. So that after a call, if a student said, hey, can you always call me on this, uh, they had that field available. So again, publisher action totally baked into the platform. Uh, there's been a few releases uh, against the action uh, over the past couple of releases. Real powerful for us uh, to help focus the coach. So one minute left. I'm going to try to bring in and show you where we're going. This is uh, me logged into production. Uh, we call this the just-in-time dashboard, and it is a Visual Force page. And for us, what it's doing is it's marking us from changing to, at the beginning, we weren't sure what the data points were. We weren't sure what the coaches needed. The coaches weren't sure what the coaches needed uh, to help their students along the way. So we've gotten that somewhat figured out to a large degree uh, to the point now we're using the just-in-time dashboard to do two things. One is we're just going to surface all of that information for you on one page. And so, for instance, I'm going to just click on a flag. And so they're able to sort and find any student that's part of any flag, where previously that was you know, three or four charts. Different reports might have different students. It's all here up front. And then finally what we can do is we're going to put the coaches in a situation where they can take action. And so one of the big deals about having information in front of you is you want to be able to do things with that information. Uh, so we're doing things that are, that are totally custom, like sending out emails, chats, or email templates, or initiating chat. And then we also have a, uh, we have a couple custom buttons baked into here. Uh, Dave showed you the project portfolio, for instance. The coach has access to the same uh, visual force that the student does. And then finally, when they go from um, term to term, we have an academic plan widget that we uh, use to help the coaches move students into the next term. So overall, daily stuff, uh, we got kind of, yeah. So overall, um, pretty fun to help these coaches uh, learn how to relate to their students. And I'm going to flip it back over to Brian uh, to close and to open it up for questions. So as you can see, I mean, I think that last example is a perfect example of Salesforce, where we were able to iterate, um, close that update there, iterate quickly and get something in the hands of um, the coaches to help them day to day right away while they figured out what they were doing without really spending much money on custom development. It was really configuration, stuff we leveraged out of the platform, um, and it was all there. So, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, we've got loads of awesomeness and a picture of Doug, because <laughs> we need that. I mean, so over the past, uh, we, haven't been in, we haven't been billing students, so October will be in business officially for one year, and we have over 1,000 students we've served, over 20,000 competencies mastered. We've got over 15 coaches using the platform. Uh, to date, we have a currently a 70% re-enrollment rate, which is really through the roof. Um, I think it's a testament to the amazing team that, that works at CFA. And uh, right now, we're managing our largest single month of new students starting September 1st. So it's been, it's been really incredible. Uh, and we work with an incredible team here. So uh, I'd like to open it up now for questions, Sandra. I know we only have nine minutes, but um, yep. feel free to. That's a good one. So we're all set. Um, so, Brian, can you give us an idea of, you know, yeah, click versus code? And when you did code, what language did you use? Did you use Visual Force, Apex, something else? Yep, so, I mean, uh, it really depends. As you can see, we've evolved. So, I mean, if you look at, uh, if you asked Doug that question a few months ago, all that stuff he showed you was click-based, right? And we got to the point of we really wanted to do something more powerful, so we went to code. 
And that page is really a visual force page with some Apex. You know, we're running some so-called queries behind the scene. So everything we do is in Apex. Everything we do is inside of Salesforce uh, in terms of what we showed you today. Um, you know, we, like I showed, we have some integrations with Crocodoc, but those are just API calls. We're pulling stuff in. So anything we can pull it into Salesforce, we will. Right now, we don't leverage anything outside that we really pull in that's not stored inside of Salesforce. Okay. And you have on your slide that there's Apex classes. What it, what is, can you explain what that means exactly? Yeah, I mean, this is our code, right? So this is, this is behind the scenes, the code that really drives a lot of that stuff. And 392 is a lot. I mean, these are things that run uh, the portal that Dave showed you, that run the evaluator portal, that run our um, curriculum development portal. Um, custom custom things we built inside during onboarding our admissions portal. We'll build an orientation portal. So, well, that that's the code. I mean, if you were to compare that, I saw someone asked about Java. If you were to compare that, that's the kind of the Java code here. It's just written. Apex is the Salesforce language uh, for those of you who are new to Salesforce. Um, and can you feature use of Salesforce as the SIS? And so what that, were the key? Yeah. And if you have any key challenges you had in terms of implementing the system as an SIS, if you sure. can hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing for us was, I mentioned at the start, is, you know, we were running on warp speed and there was no way we could get out of the door with colleague. You know, we were building the rules as we were going along, essentially, and there's no way we could get that integration built in time to leverage that. So as, as the LMS progressed, the, the SIS was almost accidental. It just evolved into, we can get this done quickly, we can get it done right away. We made the decisions. I mean, really, the, the President, Paula Blanc, really let us act independently from the rest of the college to try and disrupt uh, disrupt education and not be, be stuck to the, the ways of uh, maybe the traditional campus or even COSI. So we were lucky. I mean, we got to go really fast. And so we do have an integration point with Colleague now. Uh, you know, it's, it's not beautiful. It's been problematic. We're on an older version of Colleague. But, you know, we're getting it done. So we built some custom web services on the Colleague side that we'll do a push out. So when the students enrolled, we'll push some information over. And then right now we're using Scribe to get that information back into Salesforce. That'll eventually change to some custom web services. But again, it's really about getting it done, proving the concept out before we invest deeply into custom web services. Great. Um, another question about, you know, were there any road bumps in implementing the Salesforce solution? And how did you guys overcome them? I mean, for, for, and this is just our opinion on this, I mean, the three guys, so there's two guys with me here and a lot of the members of my team, they've all had Salesforce experience in the past. Dave, I, and Doug all worked for Job Science, as we mentioned, so we were building apps on the platform for like about five years before we got here. So we, we, we kind of knew what they were, you know, we knew how to deal with governor limits and, and how to get around those if we walked into them. Dave mentioned one today, how it, there was a limit, but you can always get creative. I mean, you just have to think outside the box a little bit to get those things done. So for us, it's been pretty smooth sailing. I think, you know, I wouldn't call it a road bump, but one of the things that does happen when you are cranking out as much work as we are because of the platform, that becomes the norm. So everyone thinks, oh, this is easy for those guys. They can just go drag some stuff around and get it done, and that's not always the case. So, um, and, you know, one of the downsides is that the downside is you do hand a lot of power off. I've, I've talked about this a lot. At one point, we weren't even in there a year, and I think we had 700 reports, and we had about 20 people working here. So how that happened, I don't know. But uh, when you hand that power over to people, you then spend some time cleaning up 700 reports and bringing that back down to a realistic number. Yeah, we, we also, as the coaching team started to ramp up, uh, we weren't able, you know, at, at the beginning when it was four coaches all sitting next to each other, we were able to kind of configure in an afternoon, train the next morning, and iterate you know, almost on a daily basis. And then as the team ramped up, I was I still felt like I was able to go that fast. Uh, but then there was change management that needed to happen internally. Um, and all, like, the training documents for new coaches had to get updated. So when they came in, it was seamless. Uh, so, again, not, 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 not exactly a speed bump, but that did uh, present some challenges internally on expectations. Well, on that vein, you know, you guys all had experience coming into it. So do you have any, like, words of advice for people who are, you know, and, and get starting to create an app on Salesforce and don't have any previous experience? The one thing I would do is document early and document often. Because mm. the one thing you want to make sure of is as you iterate and you don't keep your documents up to, to speed, you start to lose the consistency of people coming in, trying to train, trying to see how the system works. Or worse off, which we fell into this before, is not documenting 
until the very end and then trying to catch up, which is a giant nightmare. So document early and often as you release changes. Yeah, and I just to enforce that. I mean, we actually have a tech writer on our team. I mean, we document everything we do. Uh, we, you know, as they mentioned, we release stuff every four to six weeks, roughly. It doesn't get released until the documentation is done, the knowledge base article is done. Um, you know, even for me, I'd want more documentation. I know he, 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 when you're small like this and you're innovating and you're trying to come up with new ideas, you make decisions six weeks ago, you kind of forget why you made them sometimes. So, I mean, it's why did you make that data model change is key. And I think with hiring, you really need to hire some dedicated people. I mean, if you've got, uh, if you're looking to move into Apex and you've got some Java developers on staff, send them to the five, uh, 530 class, the 501 class at Salesforce. If you've got, you know, SharePoint guys that are administrators, send them to the Send them to the uh, 201 and 202 classes. Get them trained up. I mean, you can transfer those skills over, but I think you really need to separate. I've seen a lot of companies where they try and mix their admin with their developer. You know, they need to be two people if you can afford it. You need you need a Salesforce administrator. And if you can hire someone seasoned, it's well worth it because you, you, you learn a lot over time on how to make Salesforce really churn uh, and be super efficient. So if you can hire developers who are developers and admins who are admins, I, I recommend it. My my other two cents is I, I transitioned from a, a non tech position into into Salesforce and the success community was enormous uh, for me and specifically it was enormous like at that ten percent where I thought I had almost a full solution ready and then I couldn't figure out like how to run a formula or how to do a workflow update pro appropriately and um, I pro could probably give you a hundred examples off the top of my head of uh, using the community for a solution. Awesome, thank you. Two very quick questions. Um, when you did a single login with, with Gmail, you're using Salesforce Identity to do that. Is that correct? Correct, yep. Okay, great. And then the last question is um, people want to know, Dave, where they can buy your holiday sweater vest. <laughs> that was Doug. I'm, I, I wore the leather. Sorry, Doug, you're right. That's Doug. I'm reading the question, and I know it's Doug. I just read the question blank. So, yeah, that, that was, a, that was on the women's rack at Walmart the day before the ugly sweater contest, and it is a winner. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, that picture that you saw was taken um, was taken in July before we went on a uh, a company outing. I can't get back to it, but uh, that was July. It was about 85 degrees out, sunny. I don't know where the umbrella came from, but it was a great day in the lake. And when you're amongst the clouds, it's always a good day, right? Because the clouds. Exactly. Bad. Exactly. So I just want to thank. Um, Brian and Dave and Doug for presenting today. I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, as I said, the session is recorded and the slides will be available, so we'll send you an email in the next day or two where you can access that. And um, thanks again for sharing um, how you're using Salesforce to build custom apps. Yeah, and if, if anyone has questions after you didn't get your question answered, you can reach me on Twitter. You can find us. I mean, just Google around on LinkedIn. It's Doug Mailer, David McWinney, Brian Peddle. We'll be happy to get back to you. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.